Hey, everybody. It's a special Thanksgiving episode of The Smoke Filled Room. We are so grateful you're with us. And really, that's where we're going to start when talking about how thankful we are. We're just thankful for those of you who've been on this journey with us. We are at almost 30 episodes. That means almost 30 weeks of doing this. Um, and our views have always been steadily around that 250, sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little lower. Um, but when we get the feedback from everybody who watches the show, it isn't just Joe Smith from the street. It's it's legislators, it's staffers, it's party leaders, um, it's it's influencers, it's people who make this party go, who make the conservative movement go in this state. And we're really grateful you guys tune in every week. We're grateful you guys have stuck this out with us. I think we've added a lot of value, we, certainly from the feedback that we've gotten. It seems like we've added a lot of value right of center in the state over this last half year that we've been doing this. Um, but we would be nobody if you guys weren't actually watching. And for those who listen, listening. So thank you. We want to start there. Thank you to you all. Uh, I've got political team here today with us. So Abby, Chris, Matt, Michael, thank you guys for joining. Uh, we're going to do something a little different as we start today. We actually thought we'd go into this week and have fewer pieces of content to cover because it's Thanksgiving week. And yet we put together the agenda this week and we could probably just do a normal episode and fill more than an hour in a normal episode. So we do not have a shortage of topics. That said, in anticipation of this being a shorter week, we came up with some fun topics we wanted to cover. And now we've fallen so in love with that idea of covering the fun topics, we're gonna do it anyways. So we're gonna start there and then get into some of our more political topics. Um, but we're gonna have a little fun to start this. So thanks to Lane, our producer, you have those time codes with this video. If you don't wanna have fun with us, if you wanna skip past the fun conversations because you hate fun, kind of like Abby, my wife, she's the fun ruiner. She just hates, wife, hates, hates fun. Uh, if you wanna skip past that and just get to the business, you can. About halfway through this episode, we're going to get into all the business stuff. We're going to get into all the politics stuff. So you're welcome to skip past this, but it's going to be fun. So I suggest you stick around with us. Let's get into these topics. Uh, first one we have is let's have some sarcasm, sarcasm to start the day. Uh, sarcastically, what are you thankful for in Illinois politics? Who wants to start? Ooh, I, I, I looked up some stats for this one because I'm a good Republican who likes to quote stats. Um, I'm thankful for all 8,923 units of government that we have to deal with on a ah. daily basis. <laughs> I mean, I when I was, working, I, working for a political ahead. company that makes its profit off of politics. Yeah, I guess I kind of agree with you on that one. Well, I remember <laughs> when I moved here three years ago, like I was trying to like, okay, how do things work around here? And then I'm like, how many units of government do I have to learn how they function? Like, this is a craziness. So I'm so thankful. I, you know, I, I get to learn so much about all these, you know, almost 9,000 units of government that, you know, make our state run so efficiently and on, on time and on budget. Yeah. And most of those with some level of taxing power too. So that's great. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love that too. I would say uh, Chris will probably agree with this one. I'm thankful for the weekly or bi-weekly indictments because it keeps things interesting <laughs> and also it teaches us like what not to do. Like, oh, this is something that I probably can't get away with. Yeah, I'm, every time those better, come across my, every, all those every time those come across my, like I'll get a text message from somebody like, "Ooh, check the news in about 20 minutes, so and so is going to get indicted," um, and you know I'm always like. My first text is like, which one of your buddies is this, Chris? Uh, <laughs> Chris will like this one as well. I'm very thankful for a Democrat supermajority in both chambers because Lord knows if Republicans actually had to step up and lead, some of these bozos should not be given these leadership roles on our side of the aisle. So your, your, your sarcastic uh, thankfulness is... We don't have to deal with the stupidness we see in D.C. here in Illinois, because clearly a governing Republican is just something of the past. It's an oxymoron. Yeah, right. sadly. Like you're, so you're unfortunately kind of right. Um, I'm, very, day. I'm, ahead, thankful, I'm thankful for the fact that, you know, no matter how bad it gets in the state of Illinois, when inevitably the state of Illinois only has one or two Republican representatives down in Springfield, we still won't be as bad as other states. I mean, look at Michigan for Republican Party. I mean, you want oh. to talk about bozos. <laughs> or, God, I mean, look at I mean, Massachusetts. Oh, imagine being a Republican operative in that state. Dear God. So, yeah, I mean. Rhino you know, cutters. Exactly. So, no yeah. matter how bad it gets in Illinois, it could always be worse. I mean, See, now you just sound like, like Abby. My, you sound like my wife, Abby, where it's like she's she is the most, like, ridiculously – 
positive person on the planet, which is why we balance each other out very well. It's like, no matter what happens, there's always that one ray of sunshine. She's like, well, I'm so sorry you fell down and smashed your face, but at least you only lost half your teeth. It's like, come on. Uh, You're always finding that ray of sunshine. And sometimes it's kind of annoying. It's just weird hey, coming from I'm Chris. Saying, That's the funny thing. Sure. All I'm saying in Michigan, things started to go downhill once I moved to Illinois. So, you know, I can't keep two parties together in two states at the same time. So I had to make a choice. And I'm stuck with you guys. So be thankful yeah. for me. <laughs> you know, you're saying that in the sarcastic section of this video, right? <laughs> uh. All right. Any other, sar any other sarcasm to start the day or to move to the next topic? You guys got your sarcasm out of the way? All right, yeah. let's have let's let's be real. It is Thanksgiving. We should be actually genuinely thankful for something. So no nothing cliche. I'd like some seriousness here. What are you actually thankful for in Illinois politics? I would so, say like you always hear people like complain about politics and it's corrupt and it's dirty and all those things, but I feel like I have met like a lot of good people along the way that are like genuine and actually care about moving our state and country in the right direction. So that's refreshing. Thankful for the fact that I work amongst- We can't real... hear you, Chris. What? We can't hear you. I'm thankful for the fact that I work amongst real human beings in this state. Illinois actually has real people with real problems. Unlike, you know, states like, I don't know, Virginia or any of these other stupid states in the country I don't care about. So I, you know, uh -huh. I'm, glad, I'm glad we live in Illinois. And we have real people here with real problems and, you know, really, really good political operatives that, you know, at least on the Democratic side. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Chris is just like, thankful this is one of the few states that has an outlawed patronage entirely. And it's real back checking decree, so uh, it's rolling, rolling, rolling strong here. <laughs> I think it's cool that no matter how bad things get or areas that were once red and now blue, there's still a lot of people who are willing to fight no matter the cost, like tried and true believers who've made it their whole life's mission just to fight for mm -hmm. the state they love. And we see people, even when the odds are totally against them, they're like, you know what, I'm going to put my name on the ballot. I'm going to go knock doors for this candidate. I'm going to give another hundred bucks, whatever it takes, even though that they know that uh, the outcome might not be in their favor, but they're doing it because they love the cause and they love the state. So it's really encouraging to me. Yeah, I mean, I guess as someone who lives, you know, not so close to their family, I don't necessarily get to visit them as much as I would like. And so a lot of times what I love about politics, and especially here in Illinois, it's like you get people who kind of be become your family, a very dysfunctional family sometimes. But, you know, you know, it's you, you nice repeat like yourself. Isn't that just family? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I, they're not like related to me, so I don't I, I can just kick you out whenever I want. But my, my real family, I have to deal with no matter what, you know. But uh, it, yeah, it's nice knowing I have people I can count on and to support me. And, you know, and I think you guys have the same types of things. You know, when you can't see your, your family, it's nice to have folks that, you know, are there to support you. So I, I, you guys went generic. I have like actual names. Do you guys have any, any names you want to give a shout out to? Or are you guys purposely staying more generic? I can give names. I mean... I mean, I, you know, Michael, I specifically think of people like good people like Rhonda when you talk about Absolutely. like great people yeah. who just care. I mean, so Rhonda gets a lot of grief from people and it drives me crazy because it's like she's passionate. She's putting in all this time free mm -hmm. of charge. She's not getting paid for this. Um, I think of people like Don Trace, like there's these people who say, oh, we need to make a change at the state party. Don's not doing this. Don's not doing that. You guys realize nobody wants that damn job. Like. Go to any county chair, county party, and everyone's mm -hmm. like, we need to get rid of so-and-so. And they're like, okay, who, who's going to take the job? And then everyone's like, oh, mm -hmm. I don't want that job. Being a party chairman at the township level, the county level, or God forbid, the state level, is the most thankless job in all politics. You don't get paid. You pay out of your own pocket for these things. When Rhonda goes to something, when mm -hmm. Don goes to something, when your county chairman or township chairman goes to something, they're paying out of their own pocket for gas. They're paying for the ticket price. Oftentimes they're asked to sponsor, and most of the time it comes out of their pocket. Um, you know, it's just a thankless, frankly, horrible job that I don't know who's dumb enough to take, but you get those people like the Don Tracy's of the world who say, I'm going to sacrifice and do it. Whether you agree with them politically or not, whether you agree with them tactically or not, at a time like the holidays, you just need to thank them for taking the job. So 
Generically, I'd say our party leaders at every level who don't get paid for it, um, and unlike the Democrat side where these party leaders get patronage jobs, they get elected positions, because we don't win, we have nothing to give these party leaders. It requires that much more of a sacrifice, um, and they're making that sacrifice. So again, there's there's party leaders I agree with or disagree with on philosophy, on ideology, on mm -hmm. tactics, and we talk about that a lot. But today, of all days, I just want to say thank you to these party leaders who do the thankless job that I would never, ever, ever want to do. Um, and that really give of themselves. So from Don Tracy all the way down, I just want to say on the record, thank you. All right. Anyone else you guys want to give a shout out to, or are we going to the next one? We got some fun ones coming up. <laughs> all right. Let's go yes. to some of these fun ones. Uh, all right. So here's my next question. What Illinois political figures, or I guess just any figures, um, but what Illinois figures would you like to eat Thanksgiving dinner with? You got some funny with this one. <laughs> You know who doesn't get enough credit for being an Illinoisan? And of course, we're the land of Lincoln. I get it. But one person that's lived a very long time in Illinois and has been just as beneficial to the nation as Lincoln is Ulysses Grant. He lived in Galena for so long. He was president of the United States. He practically yeah, I mean, people won talk us about Civil Reagan. War. They talk about Lincoln. They rarely talk exactly. about Reagan. I would love to have dinner with Grant and just hear all his stories and his craziness. So and here's my question. Do you think you could keep up with Grant? Because dude had two hollow legs, not one hollow leg. Um, and, you know, in many portions of his life was a bit of a drunk. Do you think uh, little well, that's why it'd be fun? Uh, yeah, I don't I, I don't know how long you could keep up with Grant. I mean, I'm Irish and even I would struggle to keep up with Grant. Good point. That's why I'd have someone else like Winston Churchill there to keep up with it for him. Well, yeah, but. No He's not from Illinois. Right. So Dre <laughs> says Ulysses S. Grant. That's a, that's a good option. Or right, who else has thoughts on who they would want to share Thanksgiving with? I think so. So just coming from, from outside of, um, of Illinois, I think either like Richard Daly or like Mike Madigan mm -hmm. would be super fascinating people to, well, because, because one of the first books I read when I was here, was, it was called Boss and it talked all about Richard Daly as a mayor. And I just find his story so fascinating and his personality, like, <laughs> like the no no BS attitude. I find that like it's something that's very unique to Chicago and he was beloved. And I think Mike Madigan for everything that, you know, he's being investigated for, you hear about that all the time, like how people really love Mike and they really appreciated how genuine he was. So I just think to pick the minds of guys like that would just be super fascinating. Want to be like Mike. I mean, listen, if you want to learn how Chicago politics work, boss is not a bad place to start. Plus, Kelsey Grammer was awesome in that TV show. At least season one. Season two is kind of kind of crappy, but season yeah. one of that was incredible. So um, that's not a bad place to start. I, I think I think Old Man Daly would be or even just the Daily Clan would be kind of interesting yeah. to uh, share Thanksgiving with. All like 20 of them having, right. having I mean, Thanksgiving dinner. It'd be loud. That's for dang sure. Aren't you? Like, It'd be hard to invite Madigan because you'd have to like you couldn't call him because he doesn't have a phone. You'd have to like send a messenger pigeon, and then his his people would have to get there early, make sure there's no cameras or wiretaps. It would just be too they'd, much. They'd have to scan, or, or you just come in an orange jumpsuit and get the guy prepared. <laughs> oh, that's true. Speaking of the uh, the indicted, um, I would love to have Thanksgiving dinner with Ed Burke. Um, I know he's on trial right now, but Burke is a noted historian of the city of Chicago. Um, he's written books about the city of Chicago, and um, he's noted as a, you know, one of the experts of, you know, Chicago history and everything. And, you know, he's just an old school guy, and I think that would be a good guy to have Thanksgiving dinner with. I don't agree with. Certainly wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be boring. And listen. Every no Thanksgiving is complete without somebody at the table, like your drunk uncle making racist comments. And Ed Burke for sure would do that. So it would feel like Thanksgiving. What about you, Butler? I don't know. I was thinking about that. I would say JB, you wouldn't want to go to JB Pritzker's house because there's a pretty good chance that there wouldn't be toilets. So <laughs> the food would be good. That's see that's, There'd be a, a lot that's of food. Better than, that's better than a fat joke. The lack of toilet joke is like it's safer ground. So I like that. I don't know. Maybe like Rod Bogoyevich, that'd be pretty interesting. You Tell know, he'd be a pretty he have colorful things to say. I mean, you probably wouldn't get any words in. You would literally just listen for the entire dinner, but it, it'd be fun. And that's my true. question would be, what kind of insane crap would the do? I mean, because three out of the four things he says, you're like, what are you talking about? So it, I mean, it would be interesting. 
The problem is it wouldn't just be Blagojevich because Blagojevich doesn't go anywhere without Vargas and Kaspar just sort of hanging off his arms. So uh, it would be still it be would be basically a, a Thanksgiving with Blagojevich and Illinois Review. That would that would be your concern. Uh, <laughs> see, that's less enticing. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, so I mine take was that back, uh, uh, the Chicago field office of the FBI. Because uh, if oh, anybody's gonna have stories about Chicago. It's the it's the FBI field office because they could talk about what's going on with Madigan. They could talk about what's going on with Burke. They could talk about what's going on with all these other investigations, including like we'll never know. But I want to know how much they've gained, how much information they've gained that they couldn't take to an indictment. They have to have just buckets and treasure troves worth of information on Illinois and Chicago politicians that will never, ever, ever see the light of day. And my goodness, that would be fascinating. I thought you were going to say the White Sox so you could straighten them out, talk some sense yeah. into them. Reinsdorf? Yeah, I, the problem is like, we'd have to have dinner with Jerry Reinsdorf, but the dude's so cheap, we probably wouldn't even get a turkey. It's probably bring your own dinner then. Speaking of places you're not going to have toilets, man. Yeah. God, I, sure. Let's let, let's avoid – I just don't want to talk about or think about the White Sox or the Bears or the Bulls. Uh -huh. uh, all right, we got got a couple more topics. Uh, the best one's coming up, not this next one, it's the next one. But first, um, let's talk about which Thanksgiving uh, dish is your favorite and then which one is the worst of all the dishes. What do you guys think? All right, so one of my favorites is like a sweet potato casserole, but you have to oh, have it like all decked out with like, you know, mushroom or marshmallows and pecans and brown Ooh, sugar and all that. Fruits. I almost said mushrooms. <laughs> You got uh, you're, 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 you're leaning a full in on the sweetness. You want like sweet, sweet, sweet. Yeah, I like the savory stuff too. They like mashed potatoes and gravy and stuffing and turkey. I mean, I like it all. So the the smallest guy in our team probably eats the most food of anybody on our team at Thanksgiving. I don't know. I wouldn't say that I eat the most, but I have a well-rounded plate. You know, it's a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you probably of... have a well-rounded. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, I mean, I know you're in your 20s, but just wait till you get older like me. You do something like that. You're going to be uh, having to roll yourself around for another week. <laughs> I'd say what's, what's the worst dish to you, Michael? Hmm. I don't know, like beets or something like that. Those are always terrible. And beets are terrible. So uh, objectively. All right. Who else? I think the best dish for Thanksgiving is when we're watching the Lions lose. The worst dish is that this year they're probably going to win. So <laughs> that's the yeah. You you guys are going to be starting your Thanksgiving early, isn't that game at like eleven thirty central? Yeah, it's it's like it's twelve thirty our time. So we we in our house we have to like there were so many years where people would just be like inside the like the dining room like trying to peek at the television. So we have to time it just now because see, so listen, I, so I go to Thanksgiving with at lunch because they do a lunch. I don't. I don't understand this, but whatever. Thanksgiving lunch is what Abby's family does. And we go there every year. And they're all Packers fans. It's up in Wisconsin. Their TV is like right there. So they don't hide yeah. it. Nobody has to like pretend like they're not watching the game. Everybody just watches the game, which I really appreciate and respect. Um, though having to watch the Lions and the Packers play, I don't know how excited I'm going to be to watch that game this year. Well, I mean, it'll be nice. You just It'll just be like a repeat of last week. You know, how we beat the Bears in historic fashion. Well, I mean, the Bears more like beat themselves, but. We're going to get walloped this week, aren't we? <laughs> well, That's back correct. to food. I mean, you can't go wrong with good old-fashioned turkey, stuffing, a little gravy. Just What's your favorite? You like What's it, your one favorite? It all goes together. That's like oh, the meal. What's, one? What's your one favorite? Take stuffing. a stand. That's, that's good. Shy. Stuffing is good. Okay. Do you like it moist? Can't... Dude, with the gravy in it? Yes, and then oh, you like no, soak it together tough. with the so, turkey. So Dur Dur that's Dur what I'm saying. It all goes together. Stuffing. I, I want to get. I want to get a. I want to get a a YouTube like censorship for usage of the word moist. Like, there's a trigger warning. This uh -huh. this podcast this recording uses the word moist. Be be warned. That word uh -huh. isn't that bad. Do any of you guys use White Castle sliders as stuffing? That's like a thing. Really? Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I heard white, about that. white castle sliders are what you eat afterwards to make sure the food just shoots right out of you. Uh, no, they're they're like, or is, is, that, is that like the boot? That's rattles? why they call like, them sliders because they. Well, there's a whole thing about this because White Castle used to be closed three days a year, Christmas, Easter, and Thanksgiving, but they had to open on Thanksgiving because so many people use the sliders in their to make their stuffing. So that's a thing. You should try it out. When you're climbing up the know. ladder and you hear something splatter, it's uh, it's. I feel like I'm worse off for knowing that. 
So, Ray, yeah. what's your least crispy. favorite Thanksgiving dish? <laughs> Other know, than White Castle probably sliders? Probably green beans. Probably like a, a green, green bean beans. that's not well done. If, if they're well done, I could do it. If it's just like you just plop them out of the bag and they're right there, I can't do that. Okay. What about you, Oliver? Well, I, I get, this is like my Super Bowl, so like I have I don't know why you guys are on strong opinions because I came with like notes. So uh-huh. if gravy was its own dish, like it would be my favorite thing about Thanksgiving. You would just gravy. like put it in a bowl and just yeah, like I eat it all. Like I like it on everything. I <laughs> gravy is gravy is my favorite part, but stuffing is a close second. Also, butler, I don't know what it is about like a sweet potato casserole that you think is good, but like that that is disgusting. Yeah, the marshmallows. I, 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 this is my thing. My my worst is sweet potatoes and regular potatoes, mashed potatoes and gravy is like a Thanksgiving staple. I don't yes. understand sweet potatoes. If you asked me before last year, I'd tell you cranberries would be the thing that I'd put on my worst. Like cranberries makes no sense to me. And every cranberry dish and every Thanksgiving I've ever gone to is disgusting. However, I like a little bit of the little cranberry sauce right out of the can. You just plop it out there and. Oh yeah, oh. baby. Yeah. Uh, so Abby and I made cranberries last year and we actually made it where it was good. So cranberries have graduated from worse to me to, okay, they're not too bad because there is a way to do them where they're yeah. actually good. As for best, I mean Thanksgiving turkey's the star. I don't don't make a holiday ham. Save ham for Christmas. Turkey is the star of Thanksgiving. Don't screw around with that. It's got to be moist. It's got to be smoked, not rubbery. Like I want a good smoked, flavorful turkey. Yeah, and you got to get the butterball turkey from the store with a little popper on there, because then that way you know it's perfectly moist. Or you could just know what the heck you're doing and not need the popper. That seems like all a right. Let's work. let's go to our real fun topic. This is the one that we all did some work ahead of time, uh, uh-huh. and uh, I feel like this is the one that's going to get us the most emails and calls and texts. Uh, but uh, <laughs> let's have some fun with this. What dish would Illinois politicians bring to Thanksgiving? I have. I'll I start. Mean, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Dre. Well, the the low hanging fruit. We all know that. You know, Mike Hastings. He's going to Thanksgiving. They say, "What are you going to bring?" He said. I'll bring some potatoes. And then they say, well, what kind of potatoes? And then they're going to say, we need them mashed. And he's just going to mash the potatoes as much as he can. But then when he brings it to the dinner table, people are going to say, like some people, it's going to be crazy. They're obviously clearly mashed potatoes. And some people are going to say, those are not mashed. They'll say they're allegedly mashed. It's like, no, it's right there. They're obviously mashed potatoes. It's obviously mashed. But somehow people will still defend it and say, like, oh, they're not mashed. Allegedly mashed potatoes. So that would be the name of the dish. Mike Hastings dish yes. is allegedly allegedly correct. I like it. It's not bad. Also, a little oh. bit PC. I expect you to go a little harder at it. So kudos uh, on a good joke that we don't have to sense. So I said low hanging fruit. This one's for you, Chris. We're not really sure what Paul Vallis is bringing to Thanksgiving, but we're fairly certain he's not going to bring enough to make sure everyone gets some food. Because we all know he doesn't like to, you know, share share his, you know, things with, you know, everyone that works with him. Or you he didn't know. think that many people were going to show up for Thanksgiving dinner, and he didn't bring yeah. enough food for the rest of them. So I, I, hear I didn't he, realize I was going to make that much. You know, I hear he's been paying or he ate it all beforehand. Sandwiches. Well, he'll make sure that his pollster gets. Um, as much food as he wants. It's just everybody else that's going to be left out to dry. The bolster, the mail house, the phone banking operation in California. So the bolster all- can go around and brag about how he uh, bought a house off of uh, Paul Vallis. They'll be like, oh, shoot, I didn't realize my field staff was going to be here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Nothing for you. <laughs> what else you guys well, got? I got a whole list. We all- so you guys burned through yours. We all know that Nabila Syed, she wouldn't bring anything. She'd just eat whatever her parents make. But when (laughs) some of her friends come in, when some of her friends come in, they ask if it's kosher, and then she just goes on a rant and leaves. (laughs) I like the the, Nabila Syed will will just expect her parents to bring it for her. I like that. Uh, I think that the same used to be able to be true uh, for a certain congresswoman, but I think she did move out of her parents' basement. So I think she is now independently living. So the joke doesn't hold for her anymore. (laughs) <laughs> Tim Fox, she would say, I'm bringing a homemade chocolate chip cookies, but she would bring um, store-bought cookies, and then she'd lie about it. And people are like, well, this isn't really what I expected. And she's like, well, you know, like, isn't this good enough for you guys? Like, That one's okay. I'm trying, I'm, I'm, I was trying to work that one out, you know. 
Unkept promise. I feel like there's I was trying to think good, of, There's got to be a good Kim Fox one in here, and I'm not sure I that know. one's it. I was going to – yeah, Lori Lightfoot. I don't know exactly what she'd bring. But oh, hold on. Would, hold yeah. on. I got the Kim Fox one. It just came to me. Kim oh, Fox yeah, okay. would come with nothing. She was uh -huh. in charge of bringing the turkey, but she'd come with nothing because she let all the turkeys out, and there was none left. Uh -huh. <laughs> Well, That's the turkeys, funny. turkeys look really sad, even though they, you know, they, 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 they you can't blame the turkeys. We just need to empty out the turkey pens. Like they didn't do anything yeah. wrong. Just put them all back on the streets. The fact that they're in jail or in their little things isn't fair. So let all the turkeys out. Nobody gets turkeys for Thanksgiving. That would be the Kim Fox philosophy. That's a little better than I feel done. like. I feel like you should clarify what you mean by turkey because that could yeah, be someone's gonna like say I called like they're gonna say it was racist. Yeah, I know. It, clearly in the context it wasn't, but someone's gonna claim it was racist. You know that Brandon Johnson would show up with whatever he was asked to bring, but then he would be asking uh the other dinner guest for a couple of bucks to pay towards it. Like, hey, I bought so this. He, can you, so can Brandon you give Johnson me a couple would bucks? want to go Dutch? He'd bring he wants a little he'd give everyone to tell everyone they gotta give you some money for it. Butler, it's no, blood. Brandon Johnson. Brandon Johnson would RSVP for one, and then he knocks on the door, and he brought like five hundred of his friends, and all of a sudden they're eating dinner with everyone, and they need a place to stay as well. And they're like, and then, the and then, and then he'd have he wouldn't have the budget for it. He just expects the uh, the state or the federal <laughs> government to come in with the money to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. The, I thought he, JP he was covering that. Hold on. Chris, Chris keeps trying to speak up, but I don't know why his mic is so quiet. Let's let Chris talk. Brandon Johnson would bring exactly what you asked him to bring. And then you're going to get mad when he brings exactly what you asked him to bring. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got a good well, Brandon Johnson one, but I'm going to say it. The Will County Board Democrats would show up with one less person than they thought was going to show up, you know. Uh, like that. <laughs> and then they wouldn't be, and then they wouldn't be allowed to. It wasn't there a whole beef about the prayer in, in there too. So I feel like you could talk about Will County Democrats and uh, when your grandpa just wants to be old school and say a prayer, they'll all walk out and refuse to participate. Them and the village of Holbrook Glen, don't forget they also ban well, prayer. And DuPage Democrats, don't forget. That's yeah. So, so when grandpa just wants a nice moment, when he just wants to pray and everyone else is like, just let the guy pray, they'd be the ones who'd be like, no, no. don't let him pray. All right, what else so, you guys got? So, all right, I got two for J.B. Pritzker, and you guys got to, so either J.B. Pritzker would would just not attend, and you just write a check, say sorry, guys, couldn't make it, or he would um he would make something, and the dish would be really really bad, and somehow he'd try to find a way to blame it on someone else who had absolutely uh, nothing to do with it, like be, sorry, be the mega Republicans' fault, <laughs> yeah, or Bruce Rauner. I mean, really, you know, yeah. somehow Bruce Rauner's you know poor economy resulted in the bad you know ingredients I got for this dish. So his, sorry, guys. His his sweet potato pie was really gross, and it's Bruce Rauner's fault. Yeah, uh, dude, Bruce Rauner would bring like cranberry sauce, which no one really likes to begin with. But then it wouldn't be really hot, or it wouldn't be really cold. It'd be like lukewarm. So then the people who like hot cranberries would be pissed, and the people who like cold cranberries would be pissed because he's just like right in the middle. And it doesn't really keep pay, pander to either side. It's just everyone hates it. There you go. That's a good one. Butler, you got something? Nothing? I my, nah, I don't think so. I Maybe gave my Brandon one. Johnson one. All right. Let me uh, let me go through my list. I got, a, I got like 10 of them here. All uh -huh. right. All right. Let's go. So J.B. Pritzker would bring the alcohol. And then he'd make sure everyone knew he brought the alcohol and they all owe him now because he paid for the alcohol. And oh, by the way, don't forget Republicans are evil. <laughs> That'd be Jamie Pritzker. Like it's, it's, uh, it's all right. Like that uh, Don Harmon would bring a pork roast loaded with gravy because you know this old school politico loves his government pork. <laughs> uh, Chris Welch would bring nothing. It's his caucus's job to bring the food. So what, why would you expect him to have to do it? <laughs> That's good. That's a good one. Uh, John Curran would bring the turkey because I can't resist some form of a big bird joke or reference here. So John Curran for sure would be in charge of the turkey. For those who don't know, he's very tall. That's the joke. Uh, here we go. This is one playing off of uh, Tony McCombie and how she hates consultants, but you know uses a bunch of consultants. So Tony McCombie would bring a side cooked by a professional chef, and then she'd spend the entire dinner talking about how bad professional chefs are. I was pretty proud of that, but I'm sure I'll get in trouble for it, but I don't care. Uh, here we go. The, th the Illinois media would bring whatever Thanksgiving dish was being prepared at the nearest Hyatt in a desperate attempt to continue sucking up to J.B. Pritzker. 
Nothing? You guys can laugh. It's all right. I think these are pretty good, but whatever. Good, uh, yeah. Here we go. I got a Brandon Johnson one. Brandon Johnson would bring the appetizers, but he'd show up after dinner was over. So the appetizers would be useless because everyone would be done eating already. <laughs> uh, Eric Reinhardt, Lake County State's attorney, would bring whatever Kim Fox told him to bring. <laughs> Real. Real. True. Uh, here we go. Darren Bailey would bring the cranberry sauce, and then he'd spend 30 minutes lecturing us all about how we've forgotten the true meaning of Thanksgiving. Uh, Mark Curran, he wouldn't bring anything. He wouldn't even be invited, but he'd just show up before dinner and lead us all in prayer because God told him to do yeah. that. That actually might be a real thing that happens. Right. Not even a joke. <laughs> uh, Susanna Mendoza would bring guacamole and chips, and yes, she would double dip. <laughs> if anyone doesn't know that reference, you got to Google it. Uh, Susanna Mendoza was a sore loser when she beat Leslie Munger. Uh, and sent guacamole and chips to their election night party just to rub it in and say, don't double dip, because it was a, a talking point during the campaign. So if you don't know that reference, it's worth Googling. Susanna Mendoza is a poor loser and a poor winner. Uh, last one here. Darren LaHood would bring dessert all strategically so we could sneak in at the end and sneak out as fast as possible because he does not want to be part of this shit show. <laughs> Fair. All right, I thought I had some good ones in there. I don't know. You guys were a tough crowd. <laughs> uh, nothing I all right guess. i told you all to come ready to have some fun and I'm, I'm not sure i'm getting that come on guys let's go let's have some fun all right last sure. things here let's just leave it with a with a, a moment for you all to talk about your favorite thanksgiving memory what's your favorite memory so, all right. So I tried, this is the best one I could come up with. So when I was in college, I got invited to a Thanksgiving, uh, a Friendsgiving, you know, you know, that, that whole, that whole thing. So I volunteered to make the turkey, you know, I've never made a turkey in my life, but you know, it really seemed like a good idea at the time, but of course I had nothing. Well, of course I decided I wasn't going to cook it at the place where we were having the event and I had absolutely nothing to transport it with. So I get the turkey out of the oven. And so I, of course, I don't realize any of this until the the turkey's already cooked and we have to get it to this entire event and get it to this other place down the road. And of course, it's like 15 minutes away and it seems like, you know, it's like uphill, downhill, turns. And so finally, I'm sitting, I have to sit in the backseat of the car and I'm like desperately holding on the whole, the whole roasting pan with the turkey. I'm like, with the, like trying to make sure nothing falls and like the turkey doesn't flip over. And it was just, it was just a disaster, but it was pretty funny at the time. I could be mean and just not laugh at your story since you wouldn't laugh at my funny jokes earlier. That seems a little passive aggressive, but. Which is true. I'm not really good at the passive part. I just like the aggressive part. So yeah, yeah. I'll just say your story stinks. Or what's the, uh, what's the Zoiberg quote from, uh, from Futurama? Your story stinks and you should feel bad. There we go. That's, yeah. that's the meme. I'm kidding, Oliver. All right, who else has got it's a like story it, that they want to let me make fun of? You know, it always seems like it has something to do with the turkey. And it's always the man of the house who thinks they have this grandiose idea to, like, redo Thanksgiving and make the greatest turkey ever. So my oh, father yeah. bought this deep fryer, and it was going to be the greatest turkey ever, you know, <laughs> cook it for the right amount of time. And then if you've ever seen Christmas Vacation, you know that uh, turkey where like you open it up and then <laughs> well yeah and lane can pull up a picture uh in post it was literally black like it was darker than chris's soul like it you can't even look at it otherwise all color just stinks into it it actually wasn't that bad on the inside because just the outside got overcooked but it i'm sure it locked hilarious. in the moisture so once it once again during yes. thanksgiving references all have some ties to the word moist <laughs> I feel like you're the one who wants me to have the tie to it being moist. I don't know why, but maybe it's because we didn't laugh at your jokes. That's that's how I'm getting back at you is just uh, like fingernails on a chalkboard. All right, Chris or Michael, what do you guys got? I just know I remember one time my grandma put my dad in charge of like stirring something. I can't remember exactly what it was like food wise, you know, stir the pot. And uh, it was not successful. Like it turned out to be pretty gross. And so we just had this running joke ever since that he stirred it the wrong direction. So it's kind of like a continual thing now. Like, like don't stir it the wrong direction. Like how toilets, uh, the, the, the wives tale is that toilets spin the opposite direction in the other hemisphere. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah my, Michael's Thanksgiving is, is all ruined if you don't stir in the correct direction. Yeah. There you go. All right, Chris, you're up. No pressure. I don't really have any good Thanksgiving stories. We just gotta eat turkey and what are you are you Chandler? Do you just hate Thanksgiving? I uh, love Thanksgiving. I just don't gotta go. I mean, I got some, you know what? I have some good memories of uh, you know, because municipal petition season is during oh Thanksgiving gosh, okay. usually around there. In the odd numbered years, and the even numbered years, you've got the normal. It's always petition season during Thanksgiving. It's always petition season around uh, around Thanksgiving. So you know, I have some memories. You know, blackout Wednesday. You know, you're going out for petitions all day, and then you know you go home and party at night, or you know, Black Friday or the the Grinchmas in, in Plainfield last year. I was with Wiley, and we did uh, we did that with a couple of days after Thanksgiving. So never really on Thanksgiving, but I have some good memories of you know petition gathering around the holidays so as if on brand chris's thanksgiving memories are still tied to field and politics i know i'm oh, dedicated gosh. to my craft colin what can i say um if you had to I'd say i'd craft, say you all need to get a life but i think that means i gotta pay you more so you can get a life so i'll just i'll be perfectly <laughs> happy with you not having a life if you had to spend thanksgiving with my family colin you would you, your thanksgiving memories would all be work related too all right. All right. so mine is uh, first year after I married Abby, we went up to Thanksgiving. So we always do Thanksgiving with her family. We do Christmas with mine. And we're up in Wisconsin. They're all Packers fans. And one of the gifts that I got Abby, uh, our wedding day gifts, was jerseys for our three favorite Chicago sports teams. So White Sox, Bears, Blackhawks with Corbett on the back. Uh, and the year that we got uh, got married, so the number there for the year. So um, she wore up to Thanksgiving with her family, not only the Bears jersey to her Packers loving family, but it had Corbett on the back, the back of it. So we're just showing off that she married a Bears fan and uh-huh. that Bears fan changed her last name. And just I was not super popular with her family uh-huh. that Thanksgiving because we just sort of. <laughs> lorded it over them that uh we were bears fans and uh we changed her last name in the process so had a little fun with that one i mean what can you really expect from packers fans you know they they learn from best from aaron Rodgers to be butthurt about literally everything so it's it's not it's not wrong i mean i'm sure i'm going to spend all thanksgiving this year up there with them all telling me how great the packers are (laughs) and you know jordan love is the second coming of who the heck knows believes these things this is like but, packers but they do no, we, we got no. we got an no, hour they, long debate me and some of her us. uncles me and some of her uncles got in an hour long debate about how aaron Rodgers was the greatest quarterback of all time True. And I'm like, that's actually listen, wrong i'm giving that's you that aaron Rodgers is top five but you cannot compare his stats to a tom brady and say he's better than a brady or oh, yeah. he's better than a, how even many a good defenses or, is aaron no, Rodgers no, 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 Rodgers how many good defenses does tom brady have you know you have to think about these things Colin. so, so, so no, no 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 how many super bowls does does tom brady have versus versus aaron Rodgers? Did Aaron Rodgers care more about being MVP or more about Super Bowl? Brady Super Bowl. when he won these Super Bowls, okay? Yeah, see, there Rogers you go. Rodgers did more with less. Right. And it's all yeah, the yeah. quarterbacks of all time. Yeah. Brady, uh, Tom Brady uh, won with the, Buc- the the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That, that's a that trash team. team. You're really telling me like he had a, like a great team around that him? That team he did was not a super shit. team, Oliver. Oh, my Michael, goodness. we could take a quick recess and they'll be back. The, the year uh, before. Come that back team, later. The, the Buccaneers couldn't do anything, but whatever. Okay, so let's get into some serious topics. Uh, For those of you who are boring and are now joining us because you've skipped past all the fun topics, I encourage you to watch some of them. I especially encourage you to go back and watch the What Dish Would Illinois Politicians Break the Thanksgiving segment. I think it was pretty fun. I thought I came prepared with some good jokes. My team doesn't have a sense of humor. So let's see if you guys all agree for our viewers if there were some good ones in there, uh, I'm sure I'm going to get some HRO staffers who are going to call you guys to complain about how awful I am. But that's just normal. That's just a normal week that happens every week. So whatever. Uh, all right, let's get into some real stuff, some real political topics. Uh, first things first, let's hit the news this week. We've been following this topic for a bit uh, because there's a pack tied to Don Harmon that was specifically started up to help elect Democratic judges to the Supreme Court. Um, and as you guys all know, if you've watched any of our shows in the past, you know, Democrats played pretty loose with the rules in those Supreme Court elections, uh, doing a lot of things you're not supposed to do in elections like that. And one of those things that they did is they didn't even report some of the independent expenditures that they that they did during the course of that election, which are required to report through transparency. And this is a pack with close ties to Don Harmon. They've 
they've now been hit with what is either a record or almost a record fine by the State Board of Elections. Mm -hmm. um, they then, in order to avoid paying that fine, shifted all their money from one pack over to another, thinking they were going to be sneaky and avoid paying a fine because they just moved the money from one pack to another, mm -hmm. which isn't going to work. But of course, what would you expect from a pack tied to Don Harmon? They're old school. Uh, they're going to do everything they can to try to skirt the rules. Uh, and here we are. Once again, they were actually caught for their misdeeds, which is kind of nice. They're now being penalized with a fine that's almost $100,000. And they're trying to skirt that, which is no surprise. So I don't know if there's a ton of analysis here, but I'll open it up if anybody has any thoughts about this. I have thoughts. This feels this feels like justice for me. We all know how I feel about that that Supreme Court election. We all we all saw those ads from Mary Kay O'Brien and Elizabeth Rochford saying you know saying all these crazy things about these people and their their stance on on the pro life issue, and no one did anything about it. They didn't want to push back. They wanted to kind of play you know the traditional judicial campaign. And they ended up losing, which, you know, that's water under the bridge now. It sucks. But this feels like, you know what, the, the universe saw our pain and said, here's a gift. You're welcome. They are, they, it feels like maybe they're going to suffer a little bit for, for their crimes against these really good people. But, hey. See, I disagree. I, I, I disagree, especially with these campaign finance things. It's like the damage is already done after the election. And right. you could argue, like, really did that – did that make a difference in how the votes were cast? Maybe, maybe not. I'd probably say this, maybe not. Yeah, this, but this it doesn't matter. Ended up being fairly useless in the whole process, but at least somebody was held accountable. What? It's almost a hundred thousand, like ninety-five thousand dollar fine. I mean, that's nothing to Don Harmon. Whole I think it's, right. It's nine. It's ninety-nine five, so it's just under a hundred. Yeah, he'll no, spin that on I, Black I get, Friday probably. <laughs> Dre, I get the point you're making, but we always talk about how Democrats will will do these types of things, and they feel like, well, I can just keep doing this because you know, like I'm not going to get caught. There's not going to be any punishment, and so maybe next time they're not. Maybe it doesn't impact this race, but maybe it impacts a future race. Like for example, we have three appellate court races out, out by Chris and I that are going to be very impactful in the third appellate court. So maybe they're going to think twice about but, pulling uh, some of these Oliver, here's my concern. It's not I, even I, their money. I think your point's good, but here's my concern. For our side, when you say vindication, I think our side's going to look at this as vindication for the fact that they didn't play any of those games and say, see, look, we were right. We shouldn't have done anything political in that race. And that's not the point we want them taking out of this. I mean, listen, we've done a lot of judicial races um, and we have a great winning record on judicial races. We didn't get to do these Supreme Court races, which is frustrating. Um, and we didn't get to do some of the appellate court races last time and they all lost. Uh, so I'd love to get some of these appellate court races this time because we actually win judicial races, unlike the people who ran these losing races. Yeah. That said, I'm concerned they're going to look at this like vindication and say, see, look, we were right. And the thing is, in judicial races, there are things you cannot do. There's a line you cannot cross. The problem is, to your point, the Democrats go to and across above that line. They mm -hmm. don't care about the rules. They just want to win at any cost. We don't advocate for that. We say go up to the line and don't cross the line. But what a lot of these campaigns did is they stayed so far away from the line. There was a massive gulf that was available yeah. to them of things that they could do that also yeah. followed the rules and they didn't do it. And it's one of the many reasons why they lost. And my concern is that they're going to look at this and say, see, we were right to stay way over here. And that's part of the problem is that when you get judicial campaigns, usually their campaign teams are a bunch of lawyers, not political people. And what's what are lawyers going to do? Lawyers are going to say, here's the line, but I want to cover Don't my butt. It. Don't even come to here. <laughs> Go all the way over here to stay extra safe. And as a result, for a lot of these judicial campaigns on the Republican side, especially, most of the time, we're not doing any of the things that tactically we could be doing to win that are all allowable because they might be getting close to the line. And again, we're not advocating for any of these campaigns to ever cross the line. We've never had a client um, who has lost uh, uh, with an AARDC complaint or a GI, uh, Judiciary Inquiry Board JIB complaint. Never has happened. So I'm not saying cross the line. But the problem is there's such a wide gulf between what Republicans are willing to do, where the line is, and what Democrats are willing to do. And I love that Democrats were held accountable to a tiny, tiny, tiny regard here. Not as much as they should have been. They were at least held a little bit accountable. But my concern is that this is going to mean that in future elections, Republicans are going to stay way over here again because they're going to say, see, yeah. we were right. Yeah. I mean, they're just, mostly just... held for accountable for like playing games with disclosure stuff, right? It wasn't necessarily the content of their ads. So they got away with that. They just didn't yep. get away with the shenanigans on moving the money around and those kind of things. Regarding, 
uh, whether or not Republicans are going to be more. Chris, I don't know why. I'm sorry, buddy. We can't hear you. Okay, I'm, I don't know for whatever reason it's it's office that I can't like uh, speak in. Um, but for whatever reason, I, what I think is going to happen here is that Republicans are going to see that 99 and change number, and they're going to get like scared to death of this because, like Butler had said earlier. 99 and change is nothing to Don Harmon and these Repu and these Democratic PACs. 99 and change, it's like an entire campaign cycle for a Republican judicial candidate. So that's what I would be worried about if I were, you know, that's where I think this is going to go. Um, the, the answer to this question is, you know, if you're a legal uh, campaign for judicial race, get yourself a good lawyer and then make sure you're not doing stupid things like this, uh, like Harmon and these people were doing. Because these, this was... This is egregious. They're moving money from pack to pack. Be smarter than that. I understand it's old school politics. You can play old school politics and not do stupid stuff like this. Well, you say get a lawyer. That is not the problem for judicial campaigns. They have plenty of lawyers, but I do I do get your point. Yeah, well, and it's not right, like anyone's to going topic. to jail or... Go ahead. No, I was just, just going to say, it's not like anyone's going to jail or one specific person is being singled out and punished. So I don't really even see it as a punishment. To them, they probably just see it as, oh, this is what happens when you do it, campaigns, and it's a little expense that we didn't expect to incur. Well, no, the cost like, of doing business, right? They they love saying exactly. that about all the times they exactly. do businesses like our business. It's just the cost of doing business. That's right. Yep. Now, now in their head, they're like, okay, the max fine is ninety nine five. Exactly. Got to make sure yeah, we have And, and you're, you're, Chris, you made a very good point. Ninety nine five to them is whatever. It's the cost of doing business. Ninety nine five to us is crippling. So it's a it's a fair point. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I think Michael's going to join me in this, but uh, I titled this one Republicans Cry Crocodile Tears for Sam McCann because I think it's kind of a fun title. Uh, but it, not a lot of notice got put on this. A lot of people, not a lot of people realize that Sam McCann is being tried for campaign fraud and tax evasion. Just hasn't really hit the news. There are a lot of Republicans who were are, are very upset with Sam McCann. He was a frustration for Republicans when he served in the legislature. There was a lot of frustration for the Republican caucus dealing with Sam McCann. And then he left the Republican Party, decided to run for governor and screw the Republican Party. It was an active and overt effort to screw Ronner and the Republicans, and McCann just jumped right in with both feet. So there's a lot of people right of center who don't like Sam McCann. Uh, and his his court case uh, is moving forward. He's uh, going forward with a, with a, uh, a trial by judge. This is going to hit the news as this moves forward. Uh, he's got some serious accusations. I don't think he's going to be held to the maximum penalty, but the maximum penalty here is 45 years in prison. That won't happen. I get it. But this is a pretty serious court case that, frankly, has gotten very little notice. Uh, and I know Butler down in the uh, central Illinois area, there's a lot of Republicans who wouldn't mind seeing Sam McCann uh, getting a little bit of, of problems here. People were opening champagne bottles whenever that article dropped because people are just ready for that. We've been a long time coming. Can't wait. Yeah, it's, unfortunately, it's one of those uh, not every corruption story is a Republican, is a Democrat. Sometimes, unfortunately, there are bad Republicans, too. And he's a Republican. He's what? What did he say he was? He was like the, the conservative state, party, conservative yeah, party. Conservative party. Or, Whatever it was, yeah. The right yeah. choice for governor in 2018, by the way. <laughs> you, then, okay, so Colin mentioned earlier, I got to say this. Colin mentioned earlier about how he royally screwed the GOP in 2018 and he chose to run for governor. You think Browner had any chance of beating Pritzker without Sam McCann in that race? Come on. It didn't make no, a but difference, it, but it was still it, a pain in the ass. It was, a, it was a significant problem we had to deal with. And no, he was not the reason Ronner lost. I definitely didn't say that, but your point is valid. Ron, I would have lost either way, but Sam McCann actively tried to screw Republicans. That is my point. So no Republican is sad to see Sam McCann, uh, and I'm sure wouldn't mind to see him get a, a pretty hefty penalty here. You, you probably remember this. I don't know if it was like really only in my region or if it was throughout the state, but that election cycle, they sent out mailers in competitive House yep. districts with like Bruce Rauner yep. on a rhino and then the Republican state rep candidate on a, riding a rhino. Yep. Like, do not vote for this guy. And yep. there That's was, actually there was hilarious. Like, lost by like 250 votes, I think. Yep. Like, it was very yeah, I mean, close. They, they, so. they used that, again, we talked about with like Brady and others. Like, people people are situations that are used to hurt us beyond what they intended. Like, yeah. uh, I, I lived in one of the districts where they sent out these mailers for McCann that were, of course, designed to hurt Runner. But then on the other side, it was... You know, your incumbent state representative who's in a tier one race is horrible. And it was so this this mechanism was used to screw Republicans more than just run. That's genius. Why don't the, why doesn't the Republican Party do this? It was a smart tactic. 
So I got no problem with the tactic. We can all learn from the tactic. But McCann, there's a lot of Republicans that uh, that want to see him get screwed. That's my only point here. Well, I feel like when you see, I feel like when you see some mailers that are just like objectively terrible, like there's two sides, like as a human being, you're like, this is hilarious. As a political operative, you're like, well, this is like, this is pretty terrible. And this is kind of a smart move at the same time. So it's like, there's always that two sides, you're like, this is actually kind of funny. And then the other side, you're like, oh man, we're, this is, this is not good. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next topic here. Um, we've talked a lot about how the Democratic Party is moving further and further left. And there was a story this week that to me illustrates how far left this party has moved in just such a short period of time. So when Kwame Raul was in the Senate, he pushed a bill that increased penalties for um, people who were caught using a firearm. I'm really, 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 really generalizing here, but basically repeat felons, people who committed crimes previously who were then caught committing another crime with a firearm. This was a firearm legislation that did enhance the penalties, which nowadays, uh, this is that shift in the party where the party has now moved to that Kim Fox agenda of reducing, reducing, reducing penalties, even for gun crimes. So you've got this party that is supposedly so strong on gun control, and yet even on gun crimes, they want to reduce penalties. And Kwame Raul came out over the last week and bemoaned the fact that Democrats in Springfield during veto session, they're letting his 2018 law here um, sunset at the end of the year. They didn't extend it. Now, clearly Kwame didn't care too much because he wasn't even here while they were fighting for it. So it's a little bit of, you know, if you cared, you would have fought for this a little more. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, to me, it indicates just how far left and how quickly this party is moving. The Democratic Party is moving to the left because this was just 2018 where they passed this bill overwhelmingly. And now mm -hmm. here in 2023, um, there was just no support for it. And again, this isn't just some standard sort of penalty enhancement law. This was for specifically for gun crimes with a very, again, I'm, I'm generalizing because we don't have an hour to dip into exactly what this is, but I'm being overly general. But this is tied to a gun control sort of an issue. And yet the progressives, and it was uh, Gazzardi, a far, far left progressive who was, who was the one who killed it in the House, um, and just progressives had no interest in this bill. Uh, to me, it's just, it's kind of, hilarious to see how far and how fast the Democratic Party is moving to the left in this state. And this was just not another example. So Kwame Raul is unhappy. Here we've got a statewide Democrat who disagrees with the base of his party. Uh, and it just to me indicates yet again how far left the Democrats are moving in this state. So this, I would like to bring up a topic regarding this that I've touched on a number of times. And a lot of this has to do with the shift of the Democratic uh the heart of the Democratic caucus in Springfield, moving from being very Chicago focused to being very suburban focused. Suburban, the suburban legislatures, what their idea of controlling gun crimes is things like the assault rifle ban. That's what their idea of gun mm -hmm. control is. Historically, when you know it was more of a Chicago-centered approach, and you had people like Richard M. Daly, who was leading the charge against the handgun ban and things like that, it was really about these, these gun crimes, like handgun crimes, shootings, assault with a deadly weapon. Those were the types of crimes that were focused on by Democrats. But as Republicans in the suburbs have lost, and you have these far-left progressives taking their place in the suburbs, they're more concerned about things like assault rifle bans than they are about petty, not even petty, like the gun crimes in the city of Chicago and, and more urban areas. Well, um, and yeah. also just to build on your point, Chris, like there's been a huge focus on addressing the mental health side of this versus, you know, fo focusing on the actual crimes, you know, like, yeah, the safety act obviously in place, but now like there, we have these 708 boards, which we've talked about a lot on here, or like in DuPage, they're going to build a crisis receiving center that gives people more wide access to mental health services. So it seems like they're focusing on those, those things that, you know, those feel good type of things that, you know, that, like you're saying, the assault weapon ban, mental health, things that, you know, voters are really going to connect with and are, are going to have a big impact on Election Day. Yeah, I, it just, I don't know if there's a lot here to discuss other than pointing to it's yet another sign of that leftward shift. All right, for time, let's keep going. For time, Go let's ahead. keep going. Um, so this is a story that got very little notice. Mike Frerichs, uh, put out an op-ed that got picked up by the Sun-Times and a handful of national uh, outlets or just smaller blogs that nobody knows about. Um, but I, I just found this claim to be absolutely and utterly ridiculous. I understand partisan politics. And yes, on this podcast, we find any way to blame Democrats for pretty much anything because that's our job. 
So I get it. I get that on the left, their job is to blame Republicans for everything. But this is just taking it 17 steps too far, in my opinion. So Mike Ferrix tried to claim that Illinois Republicans would have stopped him and his wife from getting pregnant because they used IVF to get pregnant. And Illinois Republicans want to stop IVF. We hate IVF because we hate women and we hate babies and we hate everything in between, according to Ferrix. Um, and this one maybe is a little personal to me just because my wife and I had to use IVF to get pregnant. We've been trying for six over six years to get pregnant. Um, we spent over three years on IVF. It's been an incredibly frustrating and uh, expensive process. We are now pregnant. Our first child's due in April. We're really excited about it. Um, and, you know, I, it's funny because during that process, I know that there is a group of people who are really, really, really strictly religious, especially on the Catholic side, who don't like IVF, who don't believe in IVF. So when we started this process, I was a little bit careful when I would talk about this with them. I know three people specifically that I'm thinking about. And here's the crazy thing. When I did bring it up to them and just said, hey, yeah, we're doing IVF. You know what all three of them said? They didn't say, oh, we have concerns about that. They didn't say we don't believe in that or they didn't lord it over me or say that's wrong. Every single one said, we'll be praying for you. We really, really hope it works. This idea, this belief that Illinois Republicans are anti-IVF and that we would have in some way stopped them, that these right-wing groups want to ban in vitro fertilization, it's a lie. It doesn't exist. It's trying to spin something that doesn't exist just to try to make Republicans look bad. Um, and when they're talking about, I mean, in his op-ed, he talked about how if Republicans had their way um, in the process of IVF, you know, the doctor collects eggs. And for those that are not viable, Republicans would have required them to keep those. No, vi unviable embryos would not be persons in the personhood bills that they're talking about. Those would have to be discarded because they're not viable. It's a complete lie in this op-ed, just trying to make a point. Um, he tried to attack Speaker Johnson about being anti-IVF, which if you go Google this, this is, and I hate national politics, I hate reading into national politics, but no, Johnson is not against IVF. It's a stupid thing the left has drummed up, trying to make him look extreme, and they haven't been able to show any proof of it, but of course they keep bringing it out and saying it. Um, and at the end of it, he says, you know, his wife's name is Erica. Erica knew that giving birth was going to be a struggle, but post op she didn't know it might be considered a crime. No, Republicans don't want to make IVF a crime. Stop it, that's total bullshit. Um, he talked about how uh, you know, it wouldn't have that choice if it was for Republicans. Again, a total lie. Uh, let me just use the last line here. We're thankful to live in a state where we are allowed a choice to make this health care decision. No Republicans are trying to take away that health care decision. I just, this was, there are plenty of ways you can attack Republicans, and I get it, especially in things like abortion. We have a big disagreements between parties and abortion. So I understand attacking each other on that. But this was just drumming up something that doesn't exist to try to make Republicans look bad, putting complete complete utter lies all throughout an op-ed, again, in an effort to make us look bad. Shocker, the Sun-Times ran it. Um, and I just, not that I have a high opinion of Mike Ferricks, but I just think this was below him. And I felt like calling him out on this. Nobody noticed the op-ed. This isn't going to make the news anywhere. But um, I just felt like this was taking it a step too far to try to find some way to attack Republicans. Clearly, Ferricks is trying to wade in to, to get some news. He's jealous of J.B. Pritzker getting all this news. So he's trying to find his own lane. He's done a few things lately to try to get some news to maybe see if he can find his path to the governorship. I don't know. Uh, but this was total bullshit, and he deserves to be called out for it. So that's what I'm doing here. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on this or if it's just me. But I saw that. And I'm like, come on, buddy. This is you got plenty of things you can attack. This is total BS. You've made this up completely. I would just say it's obvious that he's looking for his next gig and he's kind of floating these things out there to see like, oh, can I get some attention or some traction here? Like we talked about ESG a couple of weeks ago. Now he's putting this out there. It's like your treasurer. Like what does IVF have to do with that? Especially when you're going to write an article like this, where he doesn't even name one Illinois group or one Illinois politician. He's talking about Tennessee and Louisiana and other places. Like, come on, man. Yep. Yeah, but that's just what you do if you're in politics. I mean, you just find the extreme example on either no, side and use them to make a point. I'm not saying yep. I, I agree with it. I'm saying it's a political tactic, yep. and he's getting people thinking about it. They were never thinking Republicans are going to ban IVF, but now he's just planting the seed, even if it's completely untrue. People might who are independent might be thinking, oh, are they going to? I don't know. Even if they find out that it's false later, it's still in the back of their mind. They're still pushing a narrative, no matter how slowly or carefully they're pushing it. Yeah, and politically, and Joy, it's not a bad now. move. 
Here's what I would say, though. You, you've made a valid point, and I can't disagree with anything you just said. The issue I have, though, is when Republicans play this game and we say that Mike Frerichs supports partial birth abortion and Democrats want partial birth abortion because there's some crazy Democrats out there who do want it, the media would call us out on that. And the Democrats would call us out on that and say, no, this is not true. You're taking it too far. Yeah, Mike mm -hmm. Ferricks is able to make up some complete fairy tale to make it look like all Republicans are crazy and extreme. And there's just no pushback. It's just like, yeah, sure, Republicans are that extreme. Uh, it just, you're right, DeRay, but either we need to start playing that game or the playing field needs to be fair where someone needs right. to call out Mike Ferricks for making up this complete fairy tale, one or the other. But this this situation where Ferricks is able to just get away with this complete made up falsehood, that drives me crazy. Yeah, Dre, like, the, like I get what you're saying, but like, there's so many ways you can make that point beyond this topic. As a woman, as a Republican, as a as someone who knows people who are are trying to use get pregnant through IVF, this is just like I can't even tell you how insulting this is and disrespectful. I couldn't even. I tried to read the article to get ready for this podcast. I couldn't even get through it. It's just so below the belt, like. I, like I can't even tell you like it's just so it's just so not okay on so many levels like even outside of Republican politics like it's just not okay and it just it, it just it wasn't necessary like if yeah. you need and to look at his target Matt, audience Matt, Matt's right and this is their narrative so why wouldn't they keep playing into the narrative so I get your point Matt and you're right I just the narrative is is you know Republicans hate women but look at look at nationally I mean Ted Cruz just pushed forward a bill nationally that allows women who are starting a family to stay in um I don't know again I don't follow national politics too much but he just packed the bill I tweeted about it where um it was a great bill and it was to allow Republicans to stay in when they're trying to train or law Republicans to allow <laughs> women when they're training to become um like officers in the military let me pull it up because I'm screwing this up here um it was a Republican led initiative it was a Ted Cruz led initiative um let me get it it's right here uh, on the cadet act where uh, women, um, when they were in the service academy, they'd either have to withdraw or have an abortion or surrender their parental rights because the policy didn't let them be parents and continue on um, in the service academy. And it was Republicans who led the effort to make sure that they could continue in the service academy, they continue to serve our country um, and become officers and still start their families. I mean, this the narrative is, you know, Republicans hate women and Republicans don't want to let you start a family. And it's just total BS. Uh, and we keep seeing these examples over and over of the left continuing to push that narrative. We have to push back. And if you know what, if the media is going to let them continue with their crazy narrative, mm -hmm. then maybe it's time that we start playing that same game. Yeah, yeah, I agree. The solution is you push back harder in the opposite direction. You don't get mad when they push back to us. We got to call them out for what they are. They are a lot crazier than us. We got to start pointing that out. They kill Perfect. children. I mean, we got to start using that language. I know Chris would agree with that, but. But well, all right. So let's move on. You talk about how Democrats are are have their problems. We've got three straight stories about Democrats having their problems. So let's go into each of them. Uh, Oliver, we'll start with you. It looks like if you're playing the uh, DuPage County bingo, it looks like the Democrat supervisor of Lyle Township has just gotten the full bingo, getting her third DUI. Uh, what the heck is going on in Lyle Township? So honestly, she should just have her own big bingo card in general for all the crazy stuff she does as the Lyle Township supervisor. I, I know we talked about it a little bit in another episode, but I heard recently that she... Um, she has a communications truck that she flies in from Atlanta every week and like pays for their hotel wow. on the township, like with the township money. It's just crazy stuff. But anyway, she's got her third DUI. Um, I, I mean, it's it's it kind of been floating around, but this is, you know, now it's become public. So um, she's really become a problem for the Democrat Party. Like they, they've tried, they've made public calls for her to, to resign and all this stuff. So, but she, I've heard this just, she just keeps being more and more emboldened by this, but um, we'll see well, what happens. To the, but to I the think point Dre made before, every DuPage County Republican should be highlighting this. They should be pushing it. And until yeah, she yeah. steps down, every Democrat in DuPage County needs to answer for her actions. Yeah, no, it's, I think some people, so that's kind of a funny thing that you mentioned that I think some people are like, well, maybe she just stays there. Like we have a better chance of beating her in 25. So it's like, if, but yeah, if we use she, it to our advantage, like, yeah, I love yeah. keeping her there, but we got to actually use it to our advantage. Just keeping her there and not doing anything about it doesn't help us at all. Right. So I think it's one of those things. It's like, you know, townships are important, like, you know, on the odd years and then people sort of forget about them, it seems like, until it's election time. But like this has been this has been an ongoing problem for probably at least a solid year now, maybe two. And people just are not picking up on it the way they really should. 
which is unfortunate. Well, every single Democrat in DuPage County needs to be required to speak out. And if they don't, there should be press releases. There should be public pressure on them to speak out about this. Um, and again, we need to hold, this is what they do to us. If this was a Republican, they'd be holding every Republican in DuPage County accountable until this person stepped down and even after. So uh, Republicans got to play that game in DuPage County. Yeah, because I know, like, just, just from the past, I know we're past Republican elected officials, they got one DUI and they were never able to be like really climb the ranks ever again. And they were kind of banished. And so now she, this is her third one. And she's like on top of all the other crazy stuff she does, like as an elected official and, you know, nothing's really happened. So um, it's, it's incredibly frustrating. I heard that if you fill out the punch card, if you fill out the punch card, you get enough of them, they give you a six pack as a reward. So she could cash that in pretty soon. Nice one-liner, Duray. Well played. Um, let's move over to Chris. This has been our agenda on our agenda for like four weeks, and we haven't been able to get to it. But Chris, since we're in this topic of Democrats behaving badly, the Chicago Treasurer uh, looks like this ethics violation is going to actually move forward. And now there's a third whistleblower. Uh, Conyers Irvin is in big trouble, and uh, people are talking about not only her congressional run, but will she even be able to keep her job as Treasurer with all this uh, stuff coming up? What's going on there? Yeah, so Melissa Conyers Irvin, she's the wife of 28th Ward Alderman uh, Jason Irvin. She's also the city treasurer of Chicago, recently reelected, of no opposition, of course. Um, well, she, the Essex Board in Chicago just found probable cause against her when she fired two whistleblowers from her office. This was in regards to the allegations that they did political work on government time and other, other similar ethical violations. What I really want to talk about on this topic is the implications for the congressional run, because for months, she was billed as the number one challenger to Danny Davis in the 7th Congressional District this cycle. And prior to these ethics violations coming out, um, she w- I mean, she was in Politico every week. You know, she could announce any day now, and in any day now she would announce. So it was very strange. Well, it's been, her congressional run has kind of been, I would say, on hold, at least from the media's perspective, that while these ethics violations are going through. Um, so I'm very, very curious to see if Melissa actually files come Monday in the 7th Congressional District. Um, if she does and she chooses to go forward with her campaign for Congress, she's going to have a very difficult time. And she was going to have a difficult time anyway. Um, but she's going to have a very difficult time if she chooses to go forward with her run for Congress. Um, and in addition, even if she doesn't choose to run for Congress, I mean, this is a lot of egg on her face. Like, this is, there's a third whistleblower now in regards to these ethical violations. Who knows how far this is going to get to get? This is Chicago, so the FBI is always snooping around. So, excuse me. Um, just I would be. This is something. This is a story I'm following very closely, and it's going to have. I mean, it's going to have ramifications for that seventh congressional district primary. Should she choose to still run for it? Yeah. Do you think that's sure. a coincidence, Chris? I there there are no coincidences in Chicago politics. <laughs> I true. I'd wager. Sound like a very, Calvinist, but. Well, it isn't predestined, Duray. Um, okay. But in, in any case, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm not saying this is dogma, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the reasons why these whistleblowers are popping up is in regards to um, this planned congressional run of Danny Davis' seat. It's possible. I mean, these things, kind of things have happened. Yeah. If they no. have people that inter- – like, if they have people internally that are willing to go against – their own office just because of a congressional run. That's some pretty well, they were substantial fired. political power. They were fired. That's that. That's the whole thing here is that she violated the city's ethics code by. No, but I think Duray's point is just that the people are just are 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 in a position where they've got this information. They're ready to pull the trigger if you do something they don't right. want. Well, that's how politics works. That's why you always have to be very very careful about who mm-hmm. knows what what knows who in, in politics. You never know when you decide to make a play if it's going to come back against you. So. Uh, enemies cost money, and friend uh, and friends are better to have friends than this. Have Listen, there's a reason why for a long time at Core I had a uh, a private investigator on the payroll, um, and we had a book of business about a lot of politicians. Unfortunately, he retired, and I haven't found a replacement. But um, it's a uh, uh, get information is key in politics. Maybe that's right, why we didn't move, laugh at your jokes. The third story, the third story of uh, Democrats behaving badly. This is just. Listen, I know I look for any excuse to attack Jamie Pritzker. I get it. And so this is just what that is. 
because this is a low level person. But Jenny Thornley is a story that people don't know enough about. It's a Pritzker volunteer, a financial officer who served for the state, the Illinois Police Merit Board. Uh, she volunteered for Pritzker's first campaign. She pleaded guilty to forgery. Um, she tried to forge her uh, uh, the signature of her superior to get undeserved overtime. Uh, mm -hmm. She's now going to get just 18 months of conditional discharge. She got off with a slap on the wrist. Um, charges were a lot of the charges were dropped because she uh, 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 pled guilty to the lower charges. I understand that's how a lot of this works, but she's basically getting off with a slap on the wrist. But it's yet another not so prominent. But for today's story, we're going to pretend like she's super <laughs> prominent. Yet another Democrat. Um, and another Democrat surrounding J.B. Pritzker, who was caught doing the wrong thing and has now pled guilty to it. So uh, these stories just keep piling up and piling up. So kind of uh, goes with this story, kind of doesn't, but it, it goes with the whole thing about Illinois corruption. Ed Burke's on trial right now. What's going to happen when one of these people get found not guilty? Because I've seen the Illinois Republican Party, and I've seen for years a number of prominent Illinois Republicans, every time somebody gets indicted or some investigation, somebody gets raided, they, they pounce on the opposite. And I was always the Madigan, Madigan, Madigan thing on the ground or blah, blah, blah. What happens when somebody gets found not guilty? When they, all that invest, all that time put into it, all, the, all this hype from the Republicans or even the progressives, what happens when somebody is found not guilty? I don't think that's a question because they can't win all these cases, can they? I don't know. Listen, there's there's so many corrupt people out there and they tend to be more Democrats than Republicans. Now, I know the argument is it's because there are more Democrats than Republicans. But my point is um, they got enough low hanging fruit. I don't think they're going after any of the hard cases that are hard to prove. They're just taking all the easy ones because that's already enough work. They can't keep up. And it's not like they have Kwame Rule's help to go after these Democrats. So they kind of got to do it all on their own. So there's just not enough capacity to go after the cases that might be harder to win. They're just they're busy enough with all the cases that are easy to win. <laughs> Yeah, but it and even really go on, Oliver. No, but even so, like, like to count to Countless point, like it, it's it's probably just like you could just say it's an anomaly. Like, okay, like so it's like ten to one. So like, okay, one guy got off, but like so, but there's like ten or fifteen other people who are in the you know in the same area, same time, doing the same thing. So it's like, you know, okay, we didn't get this guy, but it's clear that it's like a systemic thing. So it's not like it like it disproves the theory that the, these folks are corrupt, you know. All right, we are over our time. So we're going to cover just three political topics for campaign updates. We're going to have a ton of campaign updates in the coming weeks. As of the time of this recording, petitions are due next week. There's a one-week window. So they're, they're, the, the petition filing season starts next Monday, continues for a week. So we're going to have a ridiculous number of campaign updates. So we're just going to do a couple here today. Um, but we don't have to name names. I know some of you don't want to get people in trouble or, or get yourselves in trouble. But I do want to talk about this. Um, we are getting reports all over the state that there are a lot of Republican candidates who are short on petition signatures. The calls are frantic, looking for help. There's a lot of people you wouldn't expect to be short who are super short. Um, so it just seems like there's there's a general problem right now on the Republican side getting signatures. There's also a problem on the Democrat side, but we don't care about them. It's their job to get their people on the ballot. Just on the Republican side, there's a lot of, of groups that are scrambling to try to get candidates on the ballot right now. Um, it's worth talking about. Well, I think it's important to note, Colin, that it's not just like first time candidates. These are like mm -hmm. these are incumbent elected officials who know better. Yeah. And, the, yeah, and listen, Trump, I'm purposely I'm purposely not using names because our goal here is not to hurt Republicans. So I'm not going to tell the Democrats which ones are short on signatures. We're not going to do their job yeah. for them. But there are a lot right now. And it's it's way more than usual. And it's way more than it should be. Uh, obviously, we're going to do our jobs and try to help with that as much as we can. But ultimately, um, petitions start getting filed next Monday. And there are way too many Republican campaigns that are short on signatures. Well, he, well here's my theory. Just and I'll Chris, then I'll let you go. So here's my theory is like, if we remember last last camp um, petition season, it was, it was a month shorter. And I think, and it was, and the weather was terrible. So it, everyone I think was go, 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 go the entire time, because we knew it was going to be a challenge with the weather and the time. And I think people thought, oh, it's going to be nice out. We have more time. And I think they just got a little lazy. And, the, it's and then possible, sudden, but here's, here's the other thing. You guys know how hard it is to get people to circulate right now. Uh, yeah. There just isn't a huge base on the Republican side of volunteers and activists. And um, there's another problem. I mean, let's be honest. 
So our company, Core Strategies, we used to get over 10,000 signatures, if not in the tens of thousands for Republican candidates. We don't do that work anymore, partially because the Republican Party and the caucuses have, have done their best to try to push us out of the process. And so there's a hole now of tens of thousands of signatures that our company used to get that now we don't. Um, and, and they're kind of reaping their own negatives here. I mean, now they're calling like, hey, will you help us get signatures? It's like, you guys pushed us out and now you want us to go out and save your butts and get your signatures. We're good people. So we're doing what we can to help. But a little bit of this is hurting ourselves. When you say that every consulting company, every political company out there is evil uh, and you don't like any of your candidates work with us and now they're short on signatures, what are they going to do? I mean, again, we would get we had one employee who would get over 10,000 signatures by himself in the couple of weeks before Election Day. I mean, we got lots and lots of signatures over the years and we've been pushed out of that. So we have hurt ourselves in this process, too. This is a little bit of a self-inflicted wound. So this is the point I want to make on petition signatures. It's one thing if you're a first time candidate or the first time big race candidate, you weren't able to get all your signatures. I understand that a little bit. You're doing the process. What upsets me about this is that both Republicans and Democrats, if you're an entrenched incumbent, you've been around for a while, and you can't drum up, you know, the 500 minimum that is needed to get yourself on the ballot, there is something horribly, horribly wrong with the way you, you understand politics and government. If you are an incumbent state representative or state senator who, or mayor, whoever, and you cannot find a group of people willing who know just you personally, I'm not talking Republican organizations, nothing, who are willing to go out for you yourself to help get signatures, you are fundamentally bad at your job. Full stop. If you don't have people who like you enough to help you get on the ballot, you are not you are not uh, visible in your community and you should and you should not you should not make the ballot at that point. I have no sympathy for you. Figure it out. I can't help you. Yeah. And listen, there are Again, we're not going to do Democrats' jobs for them, so we're not going to say which districts, but there are some Republicans, either challengers in Tier 1 races or incumbents who could become Tier 1 races because they got to defend their seats, who are struggling, who shouldn't be struggling. So um, it's, it's, it's not good. And one more thing mm -hmm. on this topic. This is not the big leagues yet. This is a scrimmage. This is when it's easy or theoretically. So if, if It's not hard to get will... 500 signatures or signatures. I mean, listen, the number of times that we've had to get 10,000 signatures in the three to five days before petitions are due, every cycle we've had to do that. And it's, yeah, it's a lot of work, but that's politics. Politics is a lot of work, but just too many of our Republicans are not willing anymore to put in the hard labor to, as we've done, to stand out on Black Friday or to go out at, a, at your local grocery store. I mean, today, we're recording this on Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving is a bonanza outside of grocery stores. You could get uh, a ridiculous number of signatures outside of grocery stores. We've done that every year, every cycle. It's doable. Um, these numbers are not that difficult. To get on the ballot as a state rep, 500 signatures mm -hmm. is not hard to do. Figure it out. All right, let's get into two specific races because there's been some uh, major updates in two races. So we talked about House District 107 uh, a little bit ago. This is um, last week we talked about it. And we said that week we knew who was going to be running, but they hadn't announced it yet. And we do not burn our sources. So we didn't talk about it. It's now publicly announced. So we can finish the conversation about House District 107. There is a Republican who's going to be primarying Lane Wilhauer in uh, the 107 uh, House District. So Butler, now that we can fully talk about this race, let's talk about it. What do you got? All right. So Matt Hall, he's the Fayette County Republican chairman. Um, we'll be challenging Blaine Wilhauer. Um, IEA asked me, there are other groups that seem to be involved in this. It sounds like a lot of promises have been made, but as we know in politics, a lot of times those promises don't come to fruition. So we'll see if the poll that they claim to have, the polling data they claim to have is accurate and the financial resources that they're promising to allocate towards this race actually happens. Um, it's going to be interesting all the way through the end. Let's lay the groundwork here. So Matt Hall, the challenger, um, he's a Department of Corrections, Corrections employee. So he's part of Ask Me. Uh, so people are saying that Ask Me had a hand in this. Ask Me denies it. 
We'll just leave it at that. Um, obviously, IEA, the Illinois Education Association, has said they wanted somebody against Will Hauer. Um, They deny being part of the of, of finding this guy. Again, we don't know anything about it, so we're just going to leave it at that. Um, Will Hauer is claiming that this is McCombie and the Republicans were coming after him. They deny that. Uh, so there's a lot of accusations flying around, a lot of denials flying around. The central point here is there's a Republican being challenged by another Republican in a very, very red Republican district. Um, mm -hmm. And there are claims being made that Will Hauer is uh, vulnerable. Now, uh, the political side of it, a, a very, very conservative Republican in a very, very red district just on its face seems like a tough call to try to beat somebody like that. That's the point I made last week, and I still believe it. But we got a lot of pushback after last week's last, last week's episode about people saying, no, 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 you know, Blaine is really vulnerable. He doesn't work his district. He doesn't do constituent services. I don't know how much of this is people who just don't like him or don't like the Eastern Bloc or how much of it is true. But there is a narrative going around that Will Howard does a lot of stuff in the Capitol and does a lot of stuff in the press, but doesn't actually work his district, isn't actually present. I'm not there, so I can't speak to that. Michael, I don't know if you can speak to that, but there is a lot of chatter about this guy being super vulnerable. And if AFSCME and IEA come with big money, it's at least going to be a big race. Will they win? I don't know. I haven't seen this poll that they claim to have. I'm dubious, dubious I'm not going to lie, but there are a lot of people talking about this race. And if he does make it on the ballot, it's certainly going to be, it has the potential to be a big expensive race. Yeah, I think it's really going to come down to like how much of these promises and and uh pledges of support like actually come to fruition mm -hmm. um obviously it's tough to beat an incumbent like yeah you can have polling that shows any incumbent is vulnerable but that is just information about that one individual you've got the other side of the campaign that's got to get their message out in an effective mm -hmm. way and convince voters that yeah this guy is better than the one that you've got so i don't know i think it's going to be a tough road to hoe yeah, listen, that's an R50 district. I did not misspeak. That's an R50 district. So when you look at a district that's that Republican, you would assume it's that conservative. I just don't know where the lane is politically. This is the same conversation that we have about Boston Bailey. Like, you've got to find a lane where your voters are. And it's the same deal here. It's just funny how the people flip it. The people who don't like Darren are saying, don't like the Eastern Bloc are saying, there's no path for Darren Bailey because Boston is conservative enough that there's not a lane. And yet these same people are now saying there's a lane on Will Howard. And it's just, you have to be intellectually consistent. Either there's a lane for Bailey, which means there also is a lane for Hall, or there's no lane for either of them. I just struggle to believe that there's a lane for one, but not the other. But it's not my district. I'm certainly going to be watching it closely. Obviously, Michael will rely on you for on the ground. This is in Butlerville, so we're going to rely on you for on the ground intel on this one. Uh, but it's just, it's certainly going to be a race worth watching if he gets on the ballot. The one thing that I heard was allegedly part of this poll was that Blaine Wilhauer had voted for the um, the police bill that everybody, that was so controversial, um, where you know non-citizens can, would be eligible to be police officers. He voted for it the first time, but he voted against it the second. So I heard that that may be one of the angles that the opposition takes, but we'll see if that is successful for him. Listen, and the irony is delicious because some of the things that the Eastern Bloc is going to use to attack Mike Bost are now, and to use against Severin and and yeah. um, to use against um, some, of the, and some of the other primaries that are running down there, like Angela Evans. We heard her use some of this against Severin. We heard, uh, Michael, your, your buddy who's running for the state Senate there who's knocking on doors and making everybody angry at him. He's yeah. going to use it against uh, his opponent. Like the, the stuff the Eastern Bloc is using to primary other Republicans is now going to be used against them to primary one of their own. The irony is a little bit delicious. Somebody's going to get an Olympic medal for our, for gymnastics, I think, when this is Basically. all said. <laughs> I mean, it's it's politics. I get it. I, I don't I don't have a problem with it. It's just you know, it's it's kind of ironic. Don't, don't hate uh, the player, hate the game. That's I have one I brief say. point to, to bring up on this, and that was in regards to the constituent services thing. I'm Mr. Constituent Services. I believe constituent <laughs> services are great and they help you win elections, full stop. However, this is what I'll say. If you're going to use the constituent services angle in a Republican primary, you might want to look at the district. I don't think constituent <laughs> services are going to win or lose like uh, a Republican primary in this district. Like I think constituent services are great, and if Will Howard's bad at them, then he should be ashamed of himself. That's what he's you know hired to do by the voters of his district. 
Uh, but I don't know if that's what's actually going to win or lose the Republican primary. Well, it's yet another reason to work your district. I mean, this is when you're elected, you have two or four or in some cases six, but mostly two or four years to work your district and basically make your reelection a foregone conclusion. And I don't know if, if Will Howard has or hasn't done that, but it is just a call to the people who watch the show. When you get elected, you need to work your district. You have exclusive rights to basically campaign until your next election. And too many times on the Republican side, we don't do that. That's, this was central to the Mike Madigan playbook of get somebody mm -hmm. in and to have them work constituent services like like it's a ward operation. Work your district, get make your voters love you. So the next time you're out on the ballot, it's just an easy win for re-election. So this is, if anything, this is a reminder to Republicans that your job isn't done in terms of campaigning. You should be campaigning 365 days out of the year, whether you're on the ballot or not on the ballot, because when you're in office, you get to campaign on the taxpayers. There's nothing easier than to campaign as an incumbent. And unfortunately, we don't see a lot of these incumbents on the Republican side doing that. And now they're paying the price by not it by by struggling to get petition signatures, mm -hmm. by drawing a challenge that might be harder than it should be in a primary. If anything, this is a reminder to work your districts. Shout out to Tom Weber. He is like the definition of working your district and always being on. So we talk about the negative. I want to shout him out because he does that to a T. He's really great at it. Awesome. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Weber fan, so I can agree with you on that. Plus, apparently, we've got happy and positive Duray this week. So it's it's an answer to which Duray do we have this week. So <laughs> thanks for that, Pat. We also have All right. One other race that we haven't had a chance to get to, but it's now so much news that we have to talk about it. So House District 104, Mike Marin, we've known would be stepping down. We have talked about in the past that Democrats uh, have found their candidate, but we haven't really had a chance to get into who they found. So we're going to talk about that. Um, now there are two candidates on the Republican side and we're looking at it. Republicans have been struggling to find somebody for 104. And now it looks like Marin is actually going to be stepping down early. He was going to just retire. Now it looks like he's going to step down to become uh, president and CEO of Vermilion Advantage, which is an economic development organization there in the county. Uh, so it looks like he uh, there's going to be an appointment process. There's some drama here in 104. First of all, Republicans um, tried to find a candidate. There's a candidate that they were really actively recruiting, somebody that I love. Uh, I would love to see her get in. She's the Vermilion County GOP chairwoman. She's amazing. So they were recruiting the right person. Unfortunately, they didn't succeed. She's not running. There are now two other candidates that are looking at it. Marin's uh, legislative aide, uh, Marguerite Bailey, is looking at it. She was a legislative aide for, for Marin. Um, and apparently she was Marin's choice. Um, and Marin wanted to give this to her. The problem is that the Champaign County chairperson didn't want to appoint her, didn't want to give it to her. Uh, there's this guy, Brandon Schweitzer, who's running. He's a, a former Marine recruiter. He's announced that he's running for it. He's the brother-in-law of the Danville mayor, so he's got some local connections. So the question is going to be, who's going to get the appointment in 104? Is there going to be a really tight primary? Because it looks like both of those, if they both get on the ballot, are going to be serious candidates. Meanwhile, on the Democrat side, Democrats have gotten a guy who I think is going to be really hard to beat. Uh, IBEW business manager, Jarrett Clem. Um, he's a business manager for IBEW Local. He's a trustee for the community college district there. He's a farmer. He's a union iron worker. If, uh, he's a moderate on a number of issues. If you're looking to recruit on the Democratic side to find a candidate who could flip that House District 104 because it's going to be in play, He's the guy you get for it. So Dems have found somebody really good in that district. Meanwhile, Republicans didn't get our person. Now we've got two candidates. House uh, Republicans have said they're going to stay out of it through the primary to see who comes through it. This thing could get pretty messy. And this is a district we must hold. My numbers say it's an R4. Uh, it might play more like an R1, maybe even an even district in a presidential year. So this is a district that we might struggle a little bit to hold if we don't have a good candidate. And it looks like Dems mm -hmm. do have a good candidate. So while we talk about Republicans wanting to pick up seats, 104 is starting to play out like it might be a seat we have a tough time holding, uh, which I don't love to see because Marin was awesome. Marin held that seat. Nobody was ever going to beat Marin. He overperformed the numbers. He won by eight points last time around. And now here we are. We're going to have to fight to hold on to that district while we're trying to gain ground in other seats. So 104 is becoming a problem spot for Republicans. I think it'd be really funny to see a Marine recruiter knocking on doors. Like, I wonder if he'd accidentally mix up his line. He knocks on the door and he said, can I ask you for your vote? I mean, to uh, join the Marines? That'd just be so funny. Yeah. Huh. 
Michael, what are you hearing about 104? You got anything you're hearing about it? I think we're kind of just waiting to see how the petitions play out. Um, you know, both of these candidates kind of on the Republican side gotten late. There's word that maybe one of them might not end up getting the correct amount of signatures. Um, so it could end up resolving itself, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens with this appointment process. Um, if they can, I guess my, my question, Michael, somebody, is yeah. when you look at the type of people that HRO or the House Republican organization likes to recruit, as Marguerite Bailey seems to fit that profile. So the fact that yeah. they're staying out of it to me seems weird. There's got to be a reason for that. So I guess my question is why I aren't think they there's coming like, in Yeah, there's kind of like you had alluded to, there's a strange dynamic there because it's Vermilion County and Champaign County, and there's not agreement on who the appropriate candidate is. So instead of whatever way you go, you piss somebody off. So maybe just don't piss anybody off. See, the thing is, and I agree with that, but you either you either get involved in primaries or you don't. The problem is when you try to straddle the fence. I mean, the House Republicans mm -hmm. have shown a, a big willingness to get involved in picking the candidate that they back in a primary. They're doing it in a lot of other districts. They've pushed other candidates out to make space, to make way for their preferred candidates. There's a school of thought that that's the right thing. So I'm not here saying that's the wrong thing or the right thing. I'm just saying you either, either you do that or you don't. So the weird thing is they are getting that involved in other districts, and yet they're choosing not to here. To me, that seems odd. And I think there's more to the story than we know, because I question why they're not doing it here when they are doing it in other districts. That's just my question. Yeah. I would also say like it's probably more at, that approach is more apt to work in certain regions than others. Um, it's tougher downstate to kind of say, hey, this is the guy and go with it. Uh, you're not wrong. Again, I'm just saying to me, pick a lane. Either you're going to stay out of every primary or because you're making enemies in other districts. Why not make an enemy here, too? If you think one candidate is vastly better than the other, you get involved. The fact that they're not makes me wonder, do they not think that Bailey is the vastly better candidate? That's the only reason why you stay out of it. Or if there's something problematic that could come out about the candidate and you don't want to be tied to it, there's another reason you stay out of it. So it's just, or as you said, maybe they think this will resolve itself and they don't have to make any enemies. So I guess it's just, you know, watch it and see what happens. But we're never going to going to get out of the super minority if we're fighting defense instead of being on offense. So the fact that mm -hmm. it looks like we're going to play defense in 104, that's going to waste resources. I mean, Dems are to come in hard for Clem. If we're going to have to spend a lot of resources to hold on to 104, that means we're not investing it in some of these awesome pickup opportunities mm -hmm. that we need to be spending that money on. I mean, we've got some house districts we've talked about um, where there's some great pickup opportunities for Republicans. I know Matt up in your area, there's an awesome one that, you know, we should be picking up. We absolutely have to be picking up some of these districts like 51. And if we're spending it in 104, those are resources that aren't going into 51. So um, I think overall, this is just, just bad news for Republicans overall. All right. I know we're way over our time and it looks like I have burned out the energy of my political team. Is that everything you guys have on 104? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any final thoughts from everybody as we close out, as we go, uh, people will be watching this after Thanksgiving, but we're recording it the day before Thanksgiving. Anybody want to close with some positivity or happiness or just some final thoughts? I well, guess I the, Democrats, the Democrats' oh, favorite Thanksgiving dish is a purple district that should be Republican served on a silver ah. platter. So. I just, I just wanted to just for those who hadn't heard. So um, um, for those who follow, follow politics for a while, um, Pete Phillip, you know, longtime Senate president, he just passed away last night. Um, mm -hmm. Huge Titan in DuPage politics. I know he's going to be missed by a lot of people, not just here at DuPage, but across mm -hmm. the state. So Appreciate all all he's done for for our party. Well, and Pate, Pate is one of the few people you got to go back to the '90s to find people who have that tree. You know, like in sports, yeah. there's the coaching tree. I mean, Pate was one of the few people who Chris will love this. Used patronage to his advantage and built out a tree of of operatives and elected officials and grassroots people. I mean, he built up a bit of an army. We don't see that in politics anymore. So Pate's one of those old school people who did it and, and is one of the reasons why Republicans were actually in the majority in Springfield for a very, very yeah. short period of time. So politically, it's a big mm -hmm. loss. Um, and just, you know, personally, uh, a lot of people in DuPage County uh, certainly had good friendships and relationships there. So it's a sad, mm -hmm. uh, sad development. Michael, but, Chris, but, any closing thoughts from you guys? Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. That's all I got to yeah. say. <laughs> Thanksgiving and the first day to file petitions is on Monday. Um, so go if you need any more petitions, don't 
knock on people's doors during dinner or do it. Maybe ah. you'll get a bunch of the relatives assigned to it. Who knows? But uh, good luck to we'll bring a dish. Decisions. If some poor Republican soul knocks on your door this weekend, sign for him. It's the right thing to do. We got a country to save. There you go. Amen. All right, I'll close with, uh, I'll, be, I'll be a little cheesy, but I'm thankful for you guys, and I'm very thankful for Lane Davis, our producer. Uh, guy puts in a ton of thankless time, has to cover for all of our mistakes and, and the fact that I use bad cameras yeah. most of the time and, and our audio, <laughs> Chris's audio is awful, and he's the guy who's got to fix that. So thank you to Lane, our producer, for putting in all the hard work, and it's oftentimes thankless. Appreciate you guys. Thank you, Abby, Chris, Michael, and Matt. Um, and appreciate our viewers, our listeners. Please stick with us. I know politics is going to heat up next year, and we'll get a lot more people paying attention next year. But for those who've been with us this year, thank you. Over the next few weeks, I know it's the holidays. We're going to be here every week still sharing information. We've got some exciting plans for what do we do during Christmas when there's not going to be a lot of political developments. We've got some really cool things we're going to do to keep you guys mm -hmm. informed and make sure you guys, as our viewers, are ready for the big fight next year. As Michael said, we got a state to save. I know Michael says country. we got a country to save, too, but we got a state here in Illinois to save. So mm -hmm. thank you for everyone putting in the work. I know you're going to watch this after Thanksgiving. So I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I hope it's, if you're watching this on Friday, I hope your feet are up. I'm going to be out for Black Friday shopping because that's my favorite day of the year is Black Friday. Uh, so don't try to call me. Don't try to text me. Don't try to email me. I will be unreachable on Friday. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> we'll catch you next week.